being a mother has taught me a lot about both love and failure. I didn't know I could love like this and I didn't know that I could fail so often at loving like this. I wasn't prepared for what love would require of me or, or what love would cause me to do, uh, uh, to labor and give birth, to manage those sleepless nights, to respond to, to tantrums, uh, to being the one when a child gags, to put their hand under the child's mouth as though that's supposed to help any. I wasn't prepared for love to do that to me. I also wasn't prepared for love to cause this aching in joy when I see Sonia's pigtails bouncing as she runs or melting with affection when Bjorn sings worship songs in his room as he's falling asleep. I also wasn't prepared for what failing as a mother would be like. When I lose my temper, when I uh, don't follow through with the consequences that we've clearly laid out, when my reaction to something doesn't bring out the best in my kids. Being a good parent means loving something more than you could ever imagine, and it also means messing up with that thing you love more than you could ever imagine. Today's text offers us a picture of discipleship that feels similar. Being a disciple means loving more than you could ever imagine, and it means messing up with Jesus more than you could ever imagine. The disciple Peter gives us a great example. Would you join me uh, in reading the word of God this morning? This is from uh, John chapter 21. We're going to start in verse 15 and go to verse 19. I do invite you, if you can, to get your Bibles. Uh, it's always just helpful uh, to see what, um, what the scripture actually says on a piece of paper. I mean, you know, in the book. And so I encourage you to do that if you can't. You just listen and follow along. The words are on the screen down here. This is John chapter 21, starting in verse 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. I want us to look at this scene here just a little bit. It's easy to overlook uh, the place and space that these events take place. Place, place, I said it twice. But here we find some significance, all right? Uh, Matthew, in Matthew chapter 4, uh, verse 18, something quite significant happens. Let me read it to you. Matthew 4, in verse 18. As Jesus was walking uh, beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, that's the same Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Jesus was walking along the Sea of Galilee, and there he finds Peter. Now, we are on the shore of the Sea of Galilee again. And uh, because, because earlier we read that, that they were uh, going, uh, that Jesus appeared um, by the Sea of Galilee. That's in uh, tw John 21, starting in verse 1. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. Here they are in the Sea of Galilee. Now, the other thing that's important is that Jesus took Peter for a walk. Okay, we didn't read it, but, I, but I'm going to read for us uh, 
John 21, verse 20. Uh, it says, Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. So we can assume, even though it didn't say that Jesus took Peter for a walk before they had this conversation, that Jesus and Peter were going for a walk along the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Now that is significant because this is where Peter was called into discipleship the first time. It's the exact place that Jesus had called Peter into discipleship. I don't think this is a mistake. Here, on the shore of the sea, Peter is called and then he's called again. We read back in chapter 18 of, of John that, that the day of Jesus' crucifixion, a, a few weeks before this account took place, uh, is when Peter denies Jesus. And specifically, that Peter denies being Jesus' disciple. Peter doesn't deny the existence of Jesus the significance of Jesus, the personhood of Jesus, the divinity of Jesus. None of that is being denied by Peter. But when Peter is asked if he has any association with Jesus, he denies it. I've always thought uh, that it was the case that, that Peter denied some sort of significance or existence or personhood or divinity of Jesus, but that is not true. And I didn't know that until I prepared to preach this today. We can always learn new things, isn't it true? No, Peter denies being a disciple of Jesus. He denies a connection with Jesus, a, a following of Jesus. He doesn't deny who Jesus is, but rather he denies his relationship with Jesus. His denial wasn't cognitive, having to do with knowledge or understanding. His denial was relational. He was inadvertently divorcing himself from Jesus. This is certainly more painful for both Peter and Jesus than denying the truth of who Jesus was. Peter divorced himself from love, capital L, love itself. There are a million reasons why he did it. There was uh, uh, the, um, he wanted to protect his body. Perhaps they would have beat him like they did Jesus. He wanted to protect his reputation. Perhaps they would call him crazy. Peter was also experiencing fear because it wouldn't take much to charge Peter with the same treason and crucify him too. There are always reasons for divorcing and, and there were many reasons for Peter. I don't think he wanted to deny his relationship with Jesus. There were just too many threats swirling around him and the, the fear of it all caused him to act out. Divorcing from love seemed like the safest option at the time. After his divorce, Peter watched his beloved be crucified and die and be put in a tomb. Then he watched him be raised to new life, or at least uh, experienced this new resurrected Jesus. Peter had experienced grief after grief, all of these disciples had. First the divorce, and then Jesus' death, and along with it, a death of the trajectory of Peter's life. And then now the, the seeming reversal of all those things. But, but none of it was making sense, I'm sure, for Peter's brain. And I'm sure that, that every time Jesus showed up to the disciples all resurrected, Peter was wondering, wondering if Jesus knew what he had done. Did Jesus know? Well, of course Jesus did. Jesus predicted it. And, and so uh, to Peter, um, uh, uh, he predicted it and did so and told Peter about his prediction. Um, but I wonder if Peter wondered about the reality of it. I'm sure every time that Peter saw Jesus, he maybe just looked right above his eyes, <laughs> not into them. That he kept just a little bit of distance from Jesus so that Jesus wouldn't have the chance to, to lean over and to ask about it. Peter wanted to love Jesus again and prove it so much, literally jumping into the Sea of Galilee and swimming to shore when Jesus arrived. Uh, and Jesus, uh, Peter just 
his impulses wanted to show Jesus that love, but he couldn't bear. He couldn't bear to have Jesus look into his soul and find the truth of his denial, of his divorce. But what Jesus does, what Jesus does is he goes to the pain. Jesus goes to where the pain is for Peter. After a little breakfast, because Jesus knows you can't really rationalize with hungry people, uh, Jesus takes Peter on a walk. Jesus doesn't avoid Peter's pain. He doesn't even specifically console the pain. But he goes directly to it, gently, carefully, clearly. The subtitle of this story in the book of John is not a very good one. The subtitle interpreters of the Bible gave this section is Jesus Reinstates Peter. Honestly, what a terrible subtitle that is. Uh, God bless those interpreters. They, they ordered the Bible. They made sense of it. They put in chapters and verse numbers. They put in titles or subtitles so that we could find things more easily. It is a help, yes. They give us a lot in their organization of it, of the Bible. And they did their best. Uh, but this subtitle isn't even the truth of what happened to Peter and what Jesus does here. Jesus doesn't reinstate Peter because Peter was never uninstated. Nowhere in scripture does it say that because Peter denied Jesus, he was then denied discipleship by Jesus. Nowhere in scripture does it say that Jesus divorces Peter, nowhere in scripture, does it say that Peter's identity, his privileges, or vocation were revoked because of his denial. There is no need for being reinstated because, Jesus, uh, because Peter was never uninstated. Yes, I did make up that word. The stunning thing about life with Jesus is that even if we think we are divorced from him, he is never divorced from us. Jesus doesn't disown us when we disown him. Jesus goes to Peter's pain. And instead of glossing over it, uninstating him because of his denial and divorce, or making him pay for his betrayal by saying certain things, Peter, uh, Jesus draws Peter back into love. That's what I wish the subtitle was here. Jesus draws Peter back into love. As he walked the shore of the Sea of Galilee, Jesus asks Peter some questions. And Bible commentators on the text have made the correlation that, uh, that Jesus asks Peter the same question three times as a way to redeem his three denials. Perhaps it was a way for Jesus to bring into Peter's consciousness that his denial was no match for love. Perhaps it was helpful for Peter to confirm these things with Jesus after divorcing from the relationship. All of these things might be true, but it wasn't penance. You see, grace and love and forgiveness had already covered Peter's denial and divorce. Jesus was, was ready to receive him and to affirm him uh, and to infirm in him the love that they share and to empower him with love that would launch Peter back into ministry. It wasn't that Peter had to, to apologize three times or, or beg for forgiveness three times or, or say something three times to cover his three denials. Peter had counted himself out of Jesus' love, but, but Jesus puts Peter back into the center of love and gives him a ministry of love to the world. It's beautiful. Three times Jesus asks Peter if he loves him, but this wasn't for Jesus. It was for Peter. It was for Peter to honestly acknowledge the truth of the relationship, the unconditional love of this relationship, the impact of this relationship. Because Peter, excuse me, because Jesus is calling Peter forward in mission. And before Peter can fully grasp the extent of this mission, Jesus wants to be sure that the foundation of love is established. 
Jesus asks Peter if he loves him, and, and Jesus doesn't respond with, with empty words. Oh, that's nice, Peter. Thank you for loving me. I'm even surprised that Jesus' response isn't, I love you too. That would have been nice. But in response to Peter's profession of love, Jesus calls him to continue in ministry. Jesus trusts him to continue in ministry. It's as though Jesus is trying to get Peter to assess his level of commitment to the relationship. A relationship that takes some work on Peter's part. A relationship that will lead Peter into leadership. Jesus is preparing Peter to continue the ministry that Jesus started on earth. He is repatterning Peter's soul towards the mission of God in the world. Love feeding. Love tending to love feeding. Peter's heart must first love. Our hearts must first love. I wonder, I wonder if you have ever been on the shore with Jesus like this. If there was a time in your life that you were on the edge of something, a, a big decision, a grief-filled season, a time of desperation, a confusion about place or identity or calling, preparing for a new beginning, taking up a new thing. I wonder how you, it might have been for you on that shore to hear Jesus' questions of you, having known your past your denials and divorces, and to be given the opportunity to confirm your love. I wonder how it might be for you now when you hear Jesus respond to your profession of love with a call to action. Does it feel out of place? Does it feel cheap? Does it feel like Jesus just wants you to do stuff for him? Jesus knew the call on Peter's life. Denial and divorce could not stop it. But operating out of shame and remorse, duty or, or guilt could. Living in any sort of way out of uh, shame, remorse, duty or guilt is not what Jesus had in mind for discipleship. He wants love first. He loved first. And discipleship starts with loving Jesus. So I ask... How are you with your loving of Jesus these days? To be honest, there have been some serious seasons for me where it was very hard to love Jesus. Just like any relationship that has one or more humans in it, love is difficult. What about Jesus is easy to love? What about loving Jesus is proving difficult these days? What do you think Jesus would say to you if you said those things out loud to him? Could it be possible that Jesus is calling you to affirm your love even with those things? Jesus' interactions with Peter throughout the course of his discipleship end where they started. There on the Sea of Galilee, at the very beginning, before he had any other disciples, Jesus says, follow me. The call never changed. The mission never changed. The outpouring of love from Jesus never changed. But Peter sure did. Peter changed. And on that rock, Peter means rock, and on that rock, Jesus built his church. Jesus says uh, to Peter in Matthew 16, 18, And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Haiti will not overcome it. This simple question, do you love me? It became the foundation for Peter's identity and ministry. And I wonder what Jesus would specifically say to you in response to your love of him. For Peter, it was tending to and feeding lambs. What would Jesus invite you to? 
I don't ever like hanging questions. But I have seen in, and read in the course of Jesus' ministry that those hanging questions become the seed and the soil by which faith and discipleship is formed. And so today as we enter back into our prayer practice, this breath prayer, I'm going to invite us into a hanging question. <laughs> it may be uncomfortable. As we inhale, we will pray the prayer or hear the words of Jesus, do you love me? And as we exhale, I would like for you to each individually discern an invitation from Jesus. Your words will be different uh, than those in your home, than, those, than all of us uh, as we are gathered together far away. <laughs> This is an invitation for you to discern and listen for. And maybe for now, just listening to your exhale is prayer enough. Breath is prayer. Breathing is worship. But if a word or a phrase comes to mind, try it out. See if that works. Pay attention to it. If it comes to you later in the day, breathe it in and out a little bit. God, is this the invitation you have? You might be surprised by that word. Pretty sure Peter was surprised when Jesus said, feed my sheep, tend, ter tend to my lambs, feed my sheep. If it comes as a surprise to you, let it be. Perhaps it truly is Jesus' invitation. So as we go to God, breathing and praying, we will invite the Holy Spirit to join us. So Spirit, come. As we ponder the question, do you love me? And as we listen for and discern that invitation, would our hearts be turned towards you out of love, out of deep love?